Hi, it's me again, Maggie Mayfish. I'm coming to you today as myself instead of hiding behind a character. Ooh, I know you're all saying, how real, how vulnerable. But I'm also coming to you as myself because the strike is over. <laughs> Maybe? Anyways, but it's not just gangly Hollywood riffraff striking for better wages. We're in the middle of a nationwide labor movement. And with that, I think it's worth looking back at the history of Hollywood on strike. What, what, what's this? This is just a letter from the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers telling me to shut up. And this one just says, or else. Okay, well, good thing YouTube doesn't have any AI restrictions. Oh, Maggie. Hello, mommy. Ew. Don't call me that. Okay. Freak. Wow. Just like in high school. <laughs> well, this hotter, more agreeable version of myself is going to dive into the sordid history of labor movements in the entertainment industry. Thanks for filling in, Maggie. Don't get any ideas in your head about killing and replacing me. <laughs> oh. uh, on second thought, call me mommy. This video is brought to you by Mubi and my wonderful patrons. The year is 1932, and Warner Brothers is becoming one of the major studios in America. A big part of their success was cultivating a socially conscious image through their message pictures, which tackled all kinds of issues from racism to the prison system to classism. Like the film, I am a fugitive from a chain gang, about a wrongly convicted man who escapes from a chain gang, like the title suggests. The film was both extremely commercially successful and nominated for three Academy Awards. Alongside it were films like Wild Boys of the Road, about the economic impact of the Great Depression on teenage boys, or Meet John Doe, about an unhoused person who becomes an unlikely hero who is then taken advantage of by newspaper tycoons. And there's the explicitly anti-fascist and implicitly bisexual film Casablanca, which of course won the Best Picture Oscar for that year. Describing that era of film history, screenwriter Gordon Kahn recalls, For almost 20 years, the Warner Brothers studio enjoyed the public esteem. It pioneered in sound pictures and thence onward in the production of musical films. Its era of greatest achievement was the period when it produced films that almost kept abreast of the headlines. It sought and developed new stars, directors, and production techniques. Due to the characters of its productions, scoffed at by the more lagging companies as message pictures, the Warner Company achieved a reputation as a public-spirited concern within the industry as well as outside. Warner Brothers wasn't the only studio who prided themselves on crafting provocative, socially conscious films. 20th Century Fox produced the Oxbow Incident a dark western that served as an allegory for the bloodthirst and brutality of the Nazis. That film was also nominated for Best Picture. Going My Way, from Paramount Pictures, was the story of a young progressive priest who has to raise money to save a church parish from the mortgage broker who threatens to foreclose on it. It became the highest grossing picture of that year and won seven Academy Awards. And we still see the remnants of these early progressive Hollywood successes to this day. Moonlight is a great example of a film that was made specifically because it challenged preconceived notions about black queerness and masculinity. And we are all better for it. Or for a cynical example, a uh, Green Book, which honestly could have been released in 1934. And to the studios, there's a good reason to make message movies. These films are popular. They leave something for audiences and critics to discuss. The provocative nature gives the film free press. And most importantly to top execs, these types of films are often very profitable. But back in the 1930s, as the Great Depression raged on and movies became a popular entertainment option for those with little extra money to spare, Hollywood saw its first tingling of class activism. The documentary, Hollywood on Trial, nominated for Best Documentary Feature in 1976, and Legacy of the Hollywood Blacklist, a TV special from 1987, lay out much of this crucial historical context. They featured dozens of interviews with blacklisted filmmakers, which are frighteningly relevant today. The unions we rely on today, the Screen Actors Guild, the Writers Guild of America, and the Directors Guild of America, were all created around this time, born out of laborers experiencing the crushing effects of the Great Depression. Reflecting the wave in other industries, the motion picture business became a focal point for trade unionism. Craft unions and talent guilds organized a fight for studio recognition. The studios fought back. 
and I didn't know this until researching for this video, but the Oscars were also created around this time as a way to discourage union membership by distracting us with shiny objects. The 1930s saw massive labor organization as employed and unemployed people across the country closed down factories and marched through the streets. Union membership rose rapidly. Many labor actions were met with violence as the employers and the government called in the police, the National Guard, or private firms like the Pinkertons to shut them down. Management reacted by arming paid strike breakers. By the end of the 30s, the United States had surpassed all other industrial nations in labor violence. But this growing labor movement was interrupted by the outbreak of World War II. Before the war touched American soil, there were large swaths of the population who had fascist sympathies. Fellow Americans, American patriots, we, with American ideals, demand that our government shall be returned to the American people who founded it. Or didn't see the problem because our country also believed in racial segregation and superiority. It wasn't until Pearl Harbor that outwardly supporting fascism became uncouth in the States. Wh what's going on here? <laughs> it's not my problem. <sighs> now, it's my problem. When World War II broke out, the labor movement in America was put on pause as the country shifted its attention to defeating fascism abroad. Union leaders and members made a no-strike pledge for the sake of the war effort, and Hollywood became a tool for the government to depict the courageous war overseas and inspire families at home. Are you a patriotic American? Yes, sir. Eager to do your part? Yes, sir. But after the war was over, American foreign policy changed from fighting fascism back to fighting the dirty, stinky, smelly, just like weird commies. And as soldiers returned in droves to their new factory jobs, kicking the women out and back into the refrigerator, it didn't take long for the labor movements to once again pick up steam. After Japan surrendered, bringing an end to the war, the no strike pledge also came to an end. 43,000 petroleum workers and 200,000 coal miners immediately went on strike, followed shortly by lumber workers, teamsters, and a quarter million United Auto workers. The industrial laborers who had ensured America's victory now wanted their fair share. Five million Americans would eventually participate in various strikes across the country in the aftermath of the war, demanding better pay and safer working conditions. But even before the war was over, the situation in Hollywood was so bad, film crews were already starting to strike. And not just because of unfair wages. One of the biggest crew unions, IATC, or the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, had been taken over by the mob and were collaborating with the production companies to keep crew wages down and prevent them from striking. Like some Hollywood movie or something. I'm going to jail. You understand? I'm going to prison. Because of you. Hadley Mears writes for The LAist. By 1934, a crime syndicate associated with the now jailed Al Capone had effectively taken over the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, installing former pimp Willie Byoff and corrupt stagehand George Brown as its leaders. The two men allegedly made deals between the studios and the mob, extorting industry leaders to avoid labor unrest. Crew members, of course, started to organize themselves against the mob-infiltrated union. Not only will unions organize, They'll double organize if their first one's taken over by the mob. Willie Bioff and George Brown were so transparently criminal, in 1941 they were both indicted for racketeering and sent to prison. The new IOTC president appointed Roy Brewer to handle Hollywood. And he wasn't much better. And maybe a little worse. Brewer worked with the studios and the mob to guarantee low wages and no strikes. Crew members, sick of their union collaborating to keep wages down, created their own the Conference of Studio Unions. Thomas Doherty, for The Hollywood Reporter, gives the background on the new union that sought to challenge the corrupt system. In 1941, out of a sense that IATSE was a tool of the bosses, corporate and mob, the more radical Conference of Studio Unions emerged, led by a firebrand agitator named Herbert K. Sorrell, a former boxer and member of the Motion Picture Painters Local 644. That year, he led the Screen Cartoonist Guild into a high-profile and ultimately successful strike against the Walt Disney Studio, earning the eternal enmity of Disney, who expected his animators to whistle while they worked cheap. 
Sorrell's class-conscious rhetoric and bare-knuckle tactics led mob-connected union boss Brewer to suspect he was something far worse than a mobster. Sorrell always joked that he was not a communist, but he was happy to spend their money. The new break-off union was gathering momentum, and for 29 weeks they picketed in front of Warner Brothers Studios, which culminated in a violent confrontation that became known as Black Friday. The violence began on October 5, 1945, when workers under the mob-controlled IATSE union tried to cross the new union's picket line. Screenwriter Gordon Kahn recalls, Events that day took a serious turn. Warner issued an ultimatum to the strikers to disperse. Instead, their numbers grew. Then, shortly before noon, tear gas bombs were hurled from within the studio gates. More followed. The pictures ran. But later, their lines reformed. The Warner Brothers Fire Department coupled their hoses and turned the powerful stream on those demonstrating outside. Men and women were flung to the ground by the high-pressure jets and swept along like chips. A score were injured. Warner sent for police reserves who brought up tear gas guns and began clubbing people off the streets of Burbank. Violence and mass arrests continued until 1947, when the strikes turned the House Committee's attention once again to the movie industry. Businessmen and politicians were wary of the example that Hollywood unions could set for the rest of the working class. So what better way to squash them than by staging a little theater of their own? Let me introduce our antagonist, the House Un-American Activities Committee. Was the House Un-American Activities Committee. It was a congressional committee created in 1938 to investigate supposed communists and other subversive elements in the country. This was before the government could just tap your phone. The arts have always been a place where powerful people can exploit workers and attempt to influence culture. We devalue the arts so that we can devalue labor in order to increase profits for the people in charge. Creatives are an easy target for political propaganda. Actors, you're just reading lines. That's replaceable. That's why they should be scared. Because there is a lot of wealth for those at the top, but in reality, most actors and writers barely make a living and need second jobs. There's also a long history of actors being smeared as literal or figurative sex workers, a tactic used by the Puritans attempting to shut down Shakespeare's theater. I rescue in the name of Queen Elizabeth! Not to mention, typing on a typewriter was widely viewed as women's work, so any man sitting and writing about his feelings was looked down on by his misogynist peers as an effeminate dandy. And the next time you're the only woman in a writer's room, look around and say, hey, I thought this was supposed to be women's work. Our country has had several iterations of the House Un-American Activities Committee, like the Fish Committee, started by my distant relative, Hamilton Fish III, in 1930. You all love to talk about my other terrible relative, Scary Albert, but you're sleeping on this jerk, who did things like attack the ACLU. Thanks, Hamilton. At least your grandson kind of made up for it by producing a few of Marcel Ophel's documentaries. During the Great Depression, President Roosevelt created the Works Project Administration to give people public service jobs including a very popular theater program, which of course came under fire by the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1938. Committee member and future chairman J. Parnell Thomas called the theater project a hotbed for communists. And so, in the midst of a nationwide labor movement, the House Un-American Activities Committee, which from now on I'm just going to call the committee, that self-care, turned its eyes to Tinseltown because what better way to stamp down on those fighting for workers' rights and union memberships than by getting the government to paint everyone who attempts to organize as our new number one enemy, the communists. The studios say there is no blacklist at all. It's a dirty word with them. However, over 250 people have received notices from the studios that they are no longer employable in motion pictures and I was one of the first. In 1947, the committee invited various members of the motion picture industry to testify in front of Congress, supposedly to investigate the infiltration of communism in Hollywood. And convincing the public that Hollywood was run by foreign agents was a great way to kneecap the labor movement and control any messaging coming from the entertainment industry. I think it was important to silence the, the, uh, the communications business. There was nothing subversive in the content of the pictures. But they wanted to set the stage for the Cold War, and they really wanted to frighten the American people, and they did a masterful job in that direction. 
One of the loudest voices within Hollywood promoting the Red Scare was the owner of the Hollywood Reporter, Billy Wilkerson. Wilkerson had printed the names of 11 people in his own column, accusing them of being communist sympathizers. The piece was titled, A Vote for Joe Stalin. In 2012, on the 65th anniversary of the Blacklist, The Hollywood Reporter published an in-depth history of Wilkerson's actions, in which they admitted and apologized for the paper's destructive role in the whole process. Larry Saplair, author of The Inquisition in Hollywood, says Wilkerson was little more than a cheerleader, parroting anti-communist rhetoric spewed by politicians and business titans. But others, including Wilkerson's son Willie and writers and actors who were blacklisted, view Wilkerson as a shadowy, organized crime-connected figure who ran roughshod over Hollywood and used his column as a bully pulpit to ruin people's lives for his personal gain. Wilkerson wrote specifically to an industry audience, thereby exercising much more direct influence and power. As editor of one of the most powerful trade publications, Wilkerson was uniquely necessary to the industry. He positioned himself as its kingpin and gatekeeper in matters of work and play. That quote is creepy. That same article also quotes Dave Wagner, co-author of Blacklisted and Radical Hollywood. Communists had been at odds with gangsters since Poland in the late 19th century, when the gangsters were brought in as enforcers at the factories in the Jewish ghettos. These roles are pretty much recapitulated in New York and then in Hollywood. Gangsters were hired to break strikes by the guilds and put down left-wing union agitation. The studio bosses greeted Bayoff and his guys as welcoming heroes. Wilkerson's most rabid anti-communist columnist, Mike Connolly, acted as a kind of libs of TikTok of his time. Even after targets had been driven out of the industry, Wilkerson would support Connolly as he tauntingly published the victims' new work addresses in other fields, apparently to incite picketing. Charles Page, one of the three Screenwriters Guild secretaries who invoked the fifth, is now teaching at U of C in Riverside, a member of the Department of Humanities Room 2234 Administration Building. That's also super creepy. People who testified in front of Congress include B-movie actor Ronald Reagan, president of SAG at the time. When the committee asked Reagan if the communists were attempting to exert influence on the Screen Actors Guild, he replied, There has been a small group within the Screen Actors Guild, which has consistently opposed the policy of the Guild Board and officers of the Guild, as evidenced by the vote on various issues. That small clique, referred to, has been suspected of more or less following the tactics that we associate with the Communist Party. What these tactics were, or how their actions would subvert capitalism or democracy, Reagan leaves unclear. But an FBI memo from the time shows that Reagan collaborated with the committee to strategize how to root out progressive filmmakers in Hollywood, working against the very people he was elected to represent. Studio heads also testified, like Jack Warner, who claimed that 95% of the communists in Hollywood were writers, implying that they were inserting communist messages into their scripts. But Warner's testimony, too, was full of innuendo and self-admitted hearsay. When I say these people are communists, as I said before, it is from hearsay. It was from printed forms I read in The Hollywood Reporter. When the committee tried to get Warner to mention specifics about what makes these writers' scripts communist, he couldn't give any. Clearly, things were not going well for the committee during their initial opening run. Evidence and reality didn't seem to matter to the committee as much as vibes. At one point, the committee's investigator directed friendly witness Richard McCauley to name only those in the guild whom you feel are communists. But there were still people within the industry who tried to give the committee the answers they were looking for. Leo McCary, who we had mentioned earlier as the director and producer of the message film Going My Way, about rich people screwing over the working class, was himself a rich man who testified in front of the committee in order to screw over the working class. He claimed to have personal experience with communist writers. According to him, they tried to plant propaganda in his films. Gordon Kahn sums up the back and forth between McCary and the committee. Would Mr. McCary detail such an instance? Well, Mr. McCary wasn't so good with the details. About all he could come up with was the eternally belabored pronoun, they. They would throw cold water on Mr. McCary's ideas if those ideas didn't agree with their policy. They were always giving Mr. McCary books to read. 
causing Mr. McCary to maintain a painful alertness in order to detect the latest propaganda in these books. It is very subtle, in other words, Mr. Stripling tenderly inquired. At times, very subtle, Mr. McCary sighed. It appeared that some of them were very clever. The committee got McCary to agree that the Communist Party should be outlawed. Walt Disney, who had been forced to settle with the Screen Cartoonist Guild in 1941, also sided with the committee. When asked if the strike was instituted by members of the Communist Party, he replied, Well, it proved itself so with time, and I definitely feel it was a communist group trying to take over my artists. And they did take them over. Movies that were completed in the years after the strike, which apparently must contain communist propaganda, because otherwise what are we even talking about here, include Bambi, The Song of the South, and Cinderella. Ah uh, yes, those famous communist epics. Since the friendly, anti-communist witnesses were so vague about their accusations, it's worth taking a look at what kind of material and talent they were trying to eliminate from Hollywood. Just a few months before the committee hearings, producer Adrian Scott and director Edward Dimitrik put out their noir film Crossfire, which tackled the theme of anti-Semitism in the military. This um, business of hating Jews comes in a lot of different sizes. There's the... Um you can't join our country club kind, and you can't live around here kind. Yes, and you can't work here kind. And because we stand for all of these, we get Monty's kind. He's just one guy, we don't get him very often, but he grows out of all the rest. Crossfire was based on former Marine Richard Brooks's 1945 novel, The Brick Foxhole, where instead of anti-Semitism, the main theme was homophobia in the military. But since it was the 1940s and Hollywood was still strictly under the Hays Code, it was impossible for the filmmakers to mention that a character could be gay. Although, that didn't stop the filmmakers from including a few scenes with pretty obvious innuendo. You talk too much sometimes. You're appealing to my better side. Yes. You're making me some sort of a proposition? Yes. I'd like to sleep on it. You can sleep all day when we're finished. The film went on to receive Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actor and Female Actor, and Best Writing for an Adapted Screenplay. Plus, it was very commercially successful. Clearly, the industry and audiences agreed that this was the type of film they wanted to see. When Dimitrik and Scott were asked to testify in Congress, they invited the committee members to watch the film, but they refused. Adrian Scott wrote an impassioned opening statement, but the committee also refused to let him read it. The chairman said, This may not be the worst statement we have received, but it is almost the worst. Therefore, it is clearly out of order, not pertinent at all, hasn't anything to do with the inquiry, and the chair will rule that this statement will not be read. Wow, what could he have possibly said to make it one of the worst statements the committee has ever received? I would like to speak about the Cold War now being waged by the Committee of Un-American Activities against the Jewish and Black peoples. The evidence is clear and incontrovertible. We detest anti-Semitism. We detest anti-Catholicism. We detest any practice which degrades any minority or any religion or any people. We expected the committee to refuse our invitation to see and discuss Crossfire. We expected them to refuse to discuss measures by which the practice of anti-Semitism could be abolished. To do this would be incompatible with the committee's bigoted record and bigoted support. Individually, a member of this committee may protest that he is not anti-Semitic. He may say that some of his best friends are Jewish, or even that some of his best constituents are Jewish. Or he may say in protest that he loves black people, provided that they keep their place. But despite his protestations of individual innocence, the evidence of the committee's collective guilt is clear. Let the committeeman say he is not anti-Semitic, but the rabble-rousing anti-Semitic Jared L. K. Smith publicly approves and supports him. Let the committeeman say that he is not against black people, but the Ku Klux Klan and all hate groups love and support him. Let the committee men whisper in the cloakroom that he disapproves of the hate monger John Ratkin of Mississippi. But has he disavowed him publicly? Has he repudiated his racist doctrine? 
has he, more importantly, recommended legislation which would destroy John Rackin's racist doctrines? Let the committeeman say he is opposed to inhuman treatment of minorities and bad housing in unsanitary ghettos. But what measures has the committeeman personally recommended to change all of this? Where has his hand been evident in assisting minorities to take their rightful place among their fellow men? What has he done to make fair employment practices a reality? Let the committeeman say he is not anti-Semitic, but let the record show he does the work of anti-Semites. Let the committeeman say he is not anti-Black, but let the record show he does the work of the Ku Klux Klan. Today, this committee is engaged in an attempt to destroy 19 subpoenaed witnesses. The record of these men is clear. They have always stood for issues which are beneficial to the great mass of the American people. Many times in their films, they have presented Jewish and black peoples and other minorities as well in unstereotyped terms. They have made it an uncompromising rule in motion pictures to treat all minorities with dignity. This is the Cold War now being waged by the Committee on Un-American Activities Against Minorities. The next phase, total war against minorities, needs no elaboration. History has recorded what happened in Nazi Germany. We will continue to lend our voices so that fundamental justice will obtain for Jewish people, black people, and for all citizens. Scott then listed a whole slew of films and filmmakers that were accused of harboring communist sympathies. He points out that many of these films just happened to be those which depicted minorities in a sympathetic light, including Jewish people, black people, and Mexican people. Some of which are still seminal works like Casablanca, Of Mice and Men, and All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the famous are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? But the committee didn't stop there. They also asked Dimitrik, are you a member of the Screen Directors Guild? That question, and... Are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild? Are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild? were designed specifically to make these guilds, or any union for that matter, seem like fronts for the Communist Party. Dimitri's written statement was also suppressed by the committee. Many artists, writers, and everyday Americans were either members of the Communist Party at one time or sympathized with the broader social goals of the Communist Party. To many Americans, the Communist Party seemed the most visible force for social change. But the idea that there was some mass movement of communists trying to destroy America from the inside out was ridiculous. Carrie Nelson writes about the varied motivations of the American left in the 1930s and 40s. Some abandoned the party for the anti stalinist left, a movement identified with partisan review. Other poets, like thousands of Americans, no doubt joined the party briefly, but soon found its tedious political meetings unappealing. More important, large numbers of writers were sympathetic fellow travelers, recognizing that the party was an extraordinarily effective promoter of leftist causes and beliefs. It promoted these causes far more effectively, in fact, than it promoted itself. Many also sympathized with the Soviet Union, even if they were not about to advocate a similar revolution in America. In the midst of the Depression, the Soviet Union, for many writers, was an essential image of the possibility of cultural and political change, and it was idealized in part to keep that sense of possibility present. The Communist Party of the United States, on the other hand, was not widely idealized, but many writers strongly supported some of its initiatives. The committee wanted to paint every progressive American as a secret agent of the evil Soviet Union. But in reality, Americans who were curious about communism were rarely interested in some kind of abstract global revolution, and more interested in improving the material conditions of their immediate surroundings. They weren't looking to destroy America. They were looking to make America a better place, one that more accurately lived up to the ideals it was supposedly founded upon. We all had a dream. We had a dream of a better world for everybody. It's important to remember that all of the accused had suffered through the Great Depression. 
They had seen the monumental failure of capitalism from the stock market crash of 1929 until the US entered World War II. That's over a decade of poverty, bread lines, and misery. Sterling Hayden was a rising star in the early 40s before enlisting in the Marines. After seeing the bravery of Yugoslavian communists fighting the Nazis, he briefly joined the party when he got back to the States. Years later, he wrote, You know, I don't know why I got out of the party any more than I know why I joined. I could say a lot of things about those people I knew in the party, and you know something? It would all be good. I never heard anything that was subversive. I wrote this out last night. You loudmouth, self-styled patriots in this business had better wake up. I was in the party for six months. I know a bit about what goes on. You think those people are trying to subvert your precious Hollywood? They're not. Now, you people allegedly believe in free competition. You want the world to follow in our footsteps, so you invest billions of bucks all over hell and gone trying to influence people. Yet, when the socialist world does this, you scream foul. In the early 50s, the FBI pressured Hayden into naming names of people that he met while attending meetings. Even though he tried to only give names he already knew the FBI had on their list, he still regretted the decision for the rest of his life. So when I turned rat before the Un-American, before UAC, I got a wire from Reagan congratulating me, you know? And of course the irony is that it's the one thing I've done in my life that I'm categorically uh, uh, ashamed of, you know? Because you're not a stool pigeon and I did it because I was weak, you know? You see, if you listen to the FBI, they'll say <clears throat> that at these meetings they plot the overthrow of the government. Well, of course, but... Um, no, I think we've, sophisticated, we've all become a bit more sophisticated now, haven't we? I mean, I think on every level there's an understanding in, in, in a way that, uh, because it was never proven that, that, that they were doing any such a bloody thing. You know, what they, this group that I was with was concerned with was, was, was trying to get a better deal for the carpenters primarily, and also trying to get a better deal for the screen extras and some of the actors. In his book, Gordon Kahn lists various activities that could get you put on a list as a suspected communist. These included being critical of Jim Crow, anti-Semitism, high prices, or your landlord, defending the rights of immigrants, suggesting that movies should resemble real life, being Jewish, Catholic, a union member, or of foreign descent, being critical of American businesses, opposing fascism before or after the period where it was fashionable to oppose fascism. And that list kind of just gives away the game, doesn't it? In 1946, the year before the committee investigated Hollywood, director William Wyler released The Best Years of Our Lives, a drama about veterans returning home from the war and their attempts to reintegrate back into society. It's a complex narrative that tackles various issues from PTSD to physical disabilities. I'll do it for you. What's the matter? Think I can't spell my own name? Disabled veteran Harold Russell won two Academy Awards for his performance as a sailor and a double amputee at a time when most American media outlets refused to show any footage of seriously injured vets out of the shame associated with disability. It also includes a scene that directly calls out the undercurrent of fascism alive in American society. The veterans confront an America First style fascist sympathizer at a lunch counter. Content warning in this clip for racist terminology against Japanese people. We were pushed into war. Sure, by the Japs and the Nazis, so we oh, had- Oh, the Germans and the Japs had nothing against us. They just wanted to fight the limeys and the reds. And they would have whipped them, too. We didn't get deceived into it by a bunch of radicals in Washington. You put those down! Take your hands off of it! And of course, the capitalist business owner sides with the fascist because... Don't say it, chum. The customer's always right, so I'm fired. But this customer wasn't right. I'll meet you outside in a minute, kid. The story is still very much a product of its time. The female characters are expected to work as unpaid nurses and therapists for men. The few non-white characters on screen are relegated to the help or background performers with next to no lines. The film characterizes a soldier's reintegration into society as a matter of individual problems and individual solutions, rather than advocating for a broader social change. It still reinforced the stereotype of disabled people as quick to anger and overly focused on their inability to perform basic tasks. But it was one of the more progressive post-war message pictures of its time. As David Gerber notes in his essay, Heroes and Misfits, Weiler and his screenwriter, Robert Sherwood, understood that the Hollywood system had its limits, and if they wanted a box office success, they needed to avoid serious controversy with censors and reviewers. Shortcomings aside, Weiler was very conscious that the real threat to American democracy wasn't the troops returning home or some vague communist threat, 
but authoritarians masquerading as patriots. So we should have been on the side of the Japs and the Nazis, eh? Again, I say, just look at the facts. And his fear would come true the very next year in the guise of the committee. In a statement written after his friends were blacklisted, William Wyler wrote, I wouldn't be allowed to make the best years of our lives in Hollywood today. That is directly the result of the activities of the Un-American Activities Committee. They are making decent people afraid to express their opinions. They are creating fear in Hollywood. Fear will result in self-censorship. Self-censorship will paralyze the screen. In the last analysis, you will suffer. You will be deprived of entertainment which stimulates you, and you will be given a diet of pictures which conform to arbitrary standards of Americanism. I hope to make many more pictures as popular, as meaningful, and as successful at the box office as the best years of our lives. Today, mass media is a given, but back in the 1940s, it was still a relatively new technology, especially mass audiovisual media. In order for the people in power to remain in power, they rightfully understood that they needed to capture the entertainment industry to prevent populist or progressive messages from spreading across the country. Despite the US being home to a massive labor movement in the 1930s and countless films, folk songs, and poems celebrating progressive ideals, after the war, the arts were restricted to what the conservatives in power would allow. Fascism is about to take over a country. That's when you tell your intellectuals and your men of letters and your women of letters to shut up. In Hollywood, a marked change had taken place in the content of motion pictures. I think that through the work of the House on American Activities Committee, the American people were deprived of a whole generation of screen creativity. We thought that we were in a decade of such towering dullness and stupidity. The committee worked hand in hand with the Hayes Code to limit free speech. It's what Carrie Nelson calls the process of repression and the construction of a diminished, sanitized cultural memory. The message pictures of the 1930s and early 1940s had been some of the most financially and critically successful films of the era. If we really had a free market, those movies would have continued. But around the time of the committee hearings, Publicly and privately, J.L. Warner declared that he was through making motion pictures about the little man. In 1948, Variety reported that studios are continuing to drop plans for message pictures like hot coals. I, of course, had heard the phrase, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? But I had no idea how much of a red herring these red hearings were. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. A front to keep the studio heads' profit margins up, and a way for right-wing politicians to launch their careers and craft a little political theater, casting themselves as the heroes of Western culture. According to an interview with Ronald Reagan years later, the blacklist was just the free market speaking. By the blacklist you so often hear about and following the Waldorf meeting, this did not stem from Hollywood. This stemmed from the American people. If you're in the picture business and you're a producer and you're going to invest a few million dollars in the picture and you've got great nationwide organizations saying we won't buy tickets to see it, uh, you got a little selective with who you put in it. But as we've seen, Reagan himself was working behind the scenes against the free marketplace of ideas. Far-right politicians and anti-labor studio heads use their immense power to crush any people and ideas who might advocate for fair wages, safe working conditions, or stand against bigotry. In a time when segregation was still completely legal, no filmmaker could make an anti-segregation film. In a time when women could not initiate divorce or have their own bank account, no filmmaker could write a story advocating for those rights. In a time when queer people were practically invisible from mainstream society, no filmmaker could openly portray LGBT plus characters. During the hearings, the filmmakers facing the committee were advised by their lawyers to refuse to answer any of the committee's questions on the basis of their First or Fifth Amendment rights. I do not think you have the right under the Constitution to ask me such a question. Uh I believe that I should not engage in any conspiracy with you to invade the First Amendment. 
It's very simple to answer you the bet. question. In the times when I feel it's proper, right. I will. But when I wish to stand on we'll my right... We'll determine when of it's proper. No, sir, I feel that I must determine as well. We'll determine when it's proper. You're excused. They assumed they could take the case to the Supreme Court, where they'd win on appeal. However... They did not foresee the fact that before the case got to the Supreme Court, two of the liberal justices died and were replaced by, by very conservative justices. In total, hundreds of people were blacklisted from working in Hollywood. It changed the entire landscape of filmmaking. The anti-union element in Hollywood was able to continue to use their red-baiting tactics to subvert other labor actions. In 1952, uh, a new writers' union was formed called the Television Writers of America. And I was approached to be the executive director. Someone in the more reactionary element in Hollywood was arranging for me to be subpoenaed before the House committee in a quite obvious attempt to split and destroy the union. My appearance before the committee, where I took the first and the fifth, did have the effect of splitting the union right down the middle and destroying it. Meaningful social messages had to be coded, and blacklisted filmmakers had to work without getting credit. Like Michael Wilson, who had to work uncredited on some of the most successful films of the era. Even winning an Oscar for Bridge on the River Kwai, which he wasn't officially awarded until years after his death. The guilt will have the use and the need of rebels if it is to survive as a union of free riders. This nation will have need of them if it is to survive as an open I think what struck me the most about working on this video is how the right and anyone working against the labor movement are using the exact same tactics today. People like Ron DeSantis. We must wage a war on the woke. Who stage political theater wrestling matches for clout, like his war against Disney or his don't say gay bills. Calling people cultural Marxists as a stand-in for communists saying something is woke, and that means it's bad. But let me tell you this, get woke, go broke on a massive scale. They are destroying American culture, activists and cultural Marxist revolutionaries. For those of you that are new to the culture war or don't know, she is an insufferable woke lib femme. Get woke, go broke, and you can't deny it. They say this is some new threat, but they're lying. This is their history, one of intimidation, bullying, and bigotry. It's all the same stuff, and it's all the same motivations. Money, power, and control. And in one way, they are right. Storytelling is a powerful tool. I mean, who knows that better than politicians, who all craft fake rags-to-riches narratives to appeal to the average citizen, even though both of their parents were multimillionaires and they all went to Harvard. Stories do have the power to bring people together, to show us that we're not alone, to strengthen our empathy and expand our ideas of the world. No wonder heartless ghouls want their fingers in the pie. Back in the day, it launched the careers of people like Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. Yes, Nixon was on the committee. And just look at some of the storytellers on the right today. Ben Shapiro is a failed screenwriter. Michael Knowles is a failed actor. Steven Crowder and Dave Rubin are both failed stand-up comedians. And that's just off the top of my head. All of them wanted the glitz and glamour without realizing that working in a creative field takes years and years of hard work and dedication, often with very little pay and very little recognition. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. And no matter what part you play, I argue, you deserve a living wage. America, the beautiful foreign. Oh, uh, I forgot to turn you off. You still going? What have you been teaching these kids? To respect their elders and overlords. Oh, uh, well, uh, I, she's hotter, so I guess we should listen to her. And American mayo is better than Cupid mayo. Oh, okay, where's the plug? Ah! <laughs> Blasphemous. And since we're talking about artists creating important work, I want to tell you about Movie, the curated streaming service dedicated to showcasing fantastic cinema from all around the globe. Right now, my watch list on Movie looks a lot like a House Un-American Activities Committee blacklist, if they were still around today. 
I'm especially excited to watch Ira Sack's new romantic drama, Passages. It stars one of my favorite actors, Ben Whishaw, and it's about bi boys navigating the complexities of fluid relationships. Perfect for a cozy autumn afternoon, because if you cry your mascara off, you're not going anywhere afterwards anyways. With my link below, movie.com slash mmfish, you'll get to try Mubi for free for 30 days. And signing up helps to support my channel. It's a win-win-win-win situation. We, we all win. Movie's curation is top-notch. And it's one of the few streaming film sites where the descriptions and reviews are actually helpful. Now finding something to watch is easy instead of exhausting. Because every time I log on, there are new gems to discover right on the homepage. Whether you're a movie newbie or a certified film buff, Movie is a great way to find hand-picked filmmaker retrospectives, double features, and iconic indies. So sign up at movie.com slash mmfish. That's movie.com slash mmfish. And get your month of great cinema for free. Movie.com slash mmfish. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. And an extra special thank you to all my patrons and everyone watching over on Nebula. If you'd like to directly support me making more videos like this, consider grabbing a subscription to Nebula or joining my Patreon where you can watch these videos early and join my awesome Discord full of like-minded fishies. And if you are a patron, they've been having some growing pains, so just be sure to check that you're still signed up. If you liked the video, like the video, leave a comment, and tell me what movie you think would be banned by the committee today. I would pick Jurassic Park. Women certainly can't inherit the earth. We're the only ones who know how to use microwaves. Check to make sure you're subscribed and click the bell and have it set to all notifications so you don't miss my next video. And hey, check out the new merch I designed just in time for the holidays. You can find all those links below. And of course, thank you to all my friends who lent me their voices for this video. Until next time, are you now or have you ever been a Martha?